Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. So today we talk about predicted authentication in headless environment utilizing OIDC authentication in OpenStack from CRI. So my name is Shunya Kitada and this is Tate Hashida. So we both work at AY Corporation, specifically the private cloud team. So first of all, let me introduce our AY Corporation. LY Corporation is one of Japan's largest tech com companies formed in 2023 through the reorganization of group companies, including Line Corporation and Yahoo Japan Corporation. And uh, our company provides uh, over 100 services such as uh, Line Messaging, Yahoo Shopping, News, and more. So currently, we have two private clouds. Line Corporation has a private cloud named Velda, and if Japan also have a private cloud. So today's talk, today talk focus on authorization within Velda. So let me introduce Velda. So Velda is a private cloud created by Line. It provides both IaaS and PaaS services. And the IaaS within Velda is built using OpenStack. And uh, today's main topic is about Keystone. So this is uh, better Keystone background. So far, we have been using password authentication for the CLI. So however, uh, there were several security concerns, such as weekly password and uh, password release, or anyone. So however, uh, so, uh, the current builder uses OIDC authentication instead of password for the CLI. And this OIDC authentication for the CLI is uh, today's main topic. This is today's topic. So first part, I will talk about Keystone. And second part, so Hayashino san talk about uh, OIDC for CLI. And lastly, we will show demonstration for OIDC device authorization grant. So look forward to it. This is main dish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so first topic is about Keystone. So Keystone is an IT service for OpenStack. Keystone authenticates users using a certain authentication method and issue a user token. Users then use this token to send requests to the Nova or Advanced APIs. If the token is verified, the request is successful. Keystone provides authentication mechanisms such as password and federation. And now I will explain these two mechanisms. So first I will explain the password authentication mechanism. This mechanism uses a uh, username and password to authentication authenticate user. Here is an example of the user authenticating using the OpenStack client. So first, the user prepares an OpenRC file that contains authentication information, and the username or password or uh, project name, and more. The OpenStack command uses the information to issue a token. From Keystone's perspective, Keystone has a, a hashed user's password in the database. If the password sent by the OpenStack command matches the password in the database, the authentication is successful, and Keystone returns the user token. That's all for the explanation of the password authentication mechanism. So next, I will explain the federation authentication mechanism. Since this is related to our main topic, so I will go into more detail. The federation authentication mechanism uses an identity provider, X1 to Keystone. User authentication is handled by the identity provider instead of our, uh, ah, yeah, it's I already said, yeah. And the authentication information, uh, shared to Keystone using federation protocol such as OIDC and SAM. Keystone then trusts this information and issue a user token. There are some good points. So first, user credentials are centralized in a single identity provider. 
And OpenStack does not need to manage Aisha user credential for OpenStack. And we can also utilize high security mechanism provided by the IT, IT provider, such as multi-factor authentication or uh, one-time password and more. However, there are some considerations when using creation. First, there are several creation protocols. And we need to understand these protocol features and consider the user experience. In the second, later, uh, in the, in the second part later, I will talk about uh, this topic. In this part, I will talk about uh, Keystone Federation. So let's take a deep dive. So to understand Keystone Federation, we need to know three important things. The first is the identity provider. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the identity provider provides user authentication. Most organizations already have an identity provider. And we also have an, an identity provider, and we use it with Keystone Federation. The second is the Federation Protocol. User authentication is provided by the IT provider, and Keystone needs to receive the authentication information. This can be achieved by using Federation Protocols such as SAML and OIDC and more. Most common IT provider it supports server and YDC, and we use these protocol as, as well. The third is mapping. Keystone needs to convert to Keystone's internal data, and uh, these conversion rules are called mapping. So this is an example sequence diagram for Keystone Federation. This, exa this example is abstracted, and the actual sequence will vary based on the protocol and system configuration. However, this example should help you understand Keystone Federation itself. So, firstly, okay. So, firstly, the end user requests authentication to the identity provider, and if a user authentication successful, the identity provider returns the authentication information. And thirdly, the end user requests a token with the authentication information. And HPD verifies the authentication information. And it, it passes to Keystone. And, case, and fifthly, uh, Keystone converts the authentication information to Keystone's internal data using, by using mapping rules. And finally, uh, the user token is issued and returned to the user. Okay, so now, re let's, uh, so now let's look at more concrete example. First of all, let me share what I, say, what I want to say with this slide. Keystone Federation is simple and highly extensible. The setup for Keystone Federation is small, small enough to fit on this one slide. And most of the configuration and dependency of the Keystone Federation protocol is out of Keystone. Okay, so let's, look, let's start the explanation. So in this example, for simplicity, there is no IT provider. But this example will help us focus on the simple behavior of Keystone Federation. And also, I use the HTTP header, assuming authentication information is provided from the IT provider. OK, so firstly, focus on HTTPDConf at the top of the slide. The September if statement is an important thing. This statement means to convert the XOpenStack user HTTP header to remote user environment bias. And it passed to Keystone. The secondary, focus on the mapping rules. It means the remote user value received from HPD 
is converted to a local user value, local user name. Yeah. So this conversion rule is mapping. And thirdly, uh, focus on the IT provider and patient protocol. I create an IT provider named my IDP and patient protocol named mapped. So in this example, IT provider does not exist. So my IDP is no, has no special meaning. And the mapped protocol is general, general protocol for federation. And these names are used to request pass, as you can see. My IDP and mapped is used by pass. And now everything is ready to use Keystone Federation. Lastly, focus on the bottom of the slide. So I execute a call command with the username set in the HTTP exopass stack user, and then the user token is returned. Exopass token is uh, Keystone user token. Yes. <laughs> so that's all the explanation for Keystone Federation. The previous example used to HTTP header for authentication information. But for production, of course, we need to use YDC or SAM. Regardless of the protocol used, the basic behavior of case configuration is the same as previous example. We can freely use the various creation protocol provided by the IT, IDT provider. So, by the way, what creation protocol are we using? Traditionally, we have used the SAML protocol for web applications. However, for the CLI, fast phase prediction protocol should be used. Now, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Hashimoto. Okay, so yeah, I want to explain the, uh, why we choose the uh, OIDC. And uh, yeah, this is a requirement for the uh, CLI protocol when uh, we choose the uh, protocol. And uh, first of all, it is the uh, common protocol that is implemented by most of IDP. Yeah. And uh, second is uh, yeah, it can be easily used from the OpenStack CLI because yeah, we don't want to uh, require users to install the, some additional software or something. And the third is one is uh, yeah today's main topic and the protocols that are easy to use uh, headless environment uh, because yeah in the line uh, some users uh, many users uh, use the uh, OpenStack CI from a VM so it was important that the authenticate could be performed from the VM uh, in this context we focus on the OO uh, 2.0 device authorization graph. So, yeah, so first, yeah, let's briefly review the relationship between the OIDC and the OOS. Yeah, OOS is the protocol for the authorization. And the Open ID Connect uh, stands for the uh, Open Connect OIDC is a protocol for the authentication. So, Yeah, I, uh, it, yeah, my voice is uh, well, yeah, pretty now. Yeah, here are the uh, two flaws yeah, or yeah, the yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, We will compare the two uh, flaws in this file, uh, in this presentation. Yeah. What one is the code authorization plan? Code authorization plan yeah. is the most major uh, uh, flaw in the whole of 2.0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the second one is a device authorization grant we choose. So, 
Yeah, next page. Yeah, I want to explain hold authorization graph. Yeah, that is a very complex one. Yeah. And uh, first, uh, look at the flow when they're using the code authorization graph on the web UI. Uh, this flow is uh, most commonly used in web UI and uh, smartphone applications. So for example, yeah, this example is uh, Horizon. But uh, I found a very good example. Yeah, if you not familiar with uh, this protocol, uh, please check the this summit web page and try to uh, log in uh, to the this uh, summit web page using the open infra ID. That is uh, using the this form. And uh, when we enable the uh, developer tool in the Chrome and uh, try to uh, log in, you can confirm that the whole process in the browser. In this process, yeah, client web page uh, start the uh, authorization request and the response uh, from the IDP. And then from the IDP response, user uh, start the uh, authentication in IDP with IDP ID and uh, password and then uh, two factor authors something. And after the IDP authentication in IDP, uh, user get the uh, authorization code. And the uh, authorization code uh, sent, uh, passed to the web UI using the redirect. And the uh, web UI uh, try to get the uh, access code with uh, authorization code. Uh, yeah, IDP check the uh, authorization code and then respond the access code. Finally, web UI uh, can access to the uh, resource uh, such as the TS code. This is a very basic flow in OIDC. And the next case is the uh, code authorization graph with CLI. And uh, from one to four, yeah, the uh, same uh, flow is used. But this is here, this is a different point from the previous page. Yeah, in this case, code authorization grant. Ah, sorry, yeah. Code, uh, this, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. User uh, create a local server in the laptop and uh, receive the uh, authorization code here. And authorization code uh, passed to the CLI. And user uh, use the uh, authorization code and uh, get the uh, access to. So yeah, in this case, uh, code authorization graph can be used comfortably. And uh, this method we set up, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, this implementation is uh, used in the several CLI such as the Argo CD. But, yeah, uh, when we use a code authorization grant uh, from VM, there is a problem. Yeah, we cannot use a, a technique to uh, create a local server and get the authorization code when we use a VM. So we need to, first, we need to uh, get the authorization code in the laptop and the copy and paste uh, of the copy and paste the authorization code and via using the authorization code and get the token. Yeah, we, of course, yeah, we can get the token uh, in the VM, but yeah, user need to copy and paste the authorization. So yeah, this is a poor user experience. Yeah, so yeah, we choose the device authorization graph in the wizard of the In this flow, VM uh, start the flow and the uh, IDP <coughs> for the uh, information of the authentication. And the uh, VM shows the uh, uh, URL and the user codes like this. 
and the user access to the, this URL and uh, uh, try to authenticate in IDP. During the uh, anti user authentication, uh, VM trying to uh, get the uh, token from IDP. But uh, if, and uh, after user authentication is uh, finished, IDP respond the token, access token. And finally, VM can access to the keystone using the, this access token. Unlike the code authorization grant, device authorization grant is foreign. Oh, wait, wait. Oh. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, is foreign instead of the redirect. Uh, this provides a good user experience even in the environment without a browser such as a VM. Okay. So this is a comparison of the user task required for the authentication. Yeah. In code authorization grant, user need to copy the authorization code and paste the code to the VM. And the VM try to get the token. But uh, device authorization grant, user just click the URL display in the terminal. And the uh, terminal. So yeah, we choose the device authorization grant. So yeah, I want to uh, show the demonstration of the this flow. Oh, sorry. So. First, uh, we show the OpenRC file of the this demo. Uh, first part is a common in the upper stack, they are basic information of the authentication. And the third part is very important. We try to get the open keystone token using the OIDC. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, specify the OIDC device of Z. So, yeah. And we get the token and fill the keystone token to the OS token. And we specify the OS OAuth type in uh, V3 token. So when we source the, oh, okay, source the, this operacy file shows the URL and access to the, this URL. Yeah, this is the IDP for this demo. And then we fill the user ID and the password and then check the uh, right. And uh, go back to the, this terminal. Yeah, we can use the opposite command like this. So, yeah. Uh, please see this form again. Yeah, if there is a session, we don't need to fill the user ID and the password. So, yeah, very, we can uh, use the uh, open stack with OIDC very quickly. Okay, so this is a sample of the open IC file. Yeah, this is a very common part of the open stack. And then this part is the uh, OIDC. So when uh, source the, this open file, uh, open stack client try to get the open stack token, a uh, keystone token using the OIDC device also. And then we uh, specify the IDP information here. So yeah, when so the, this OpenRC, we uh, authenticate, authenticate in IDP at once. After that, we can access the Keystone resource using the or Keystone token. So we uh, issue the Keystone token, Keystone command, uh, OpenStack command, we don't need to uh, OIDC OS.
but we don't need to use the OIDC OS. So yeah, to achieve this demo, we create uh, uh, two small patches in upstream. Yes, yeah, thank you for your review. And uh, moving, and uh, in for future plan, yeah, we found uh, some implementation that not fully meet the RSC behavior. And so yeah, we want to fix it them. Uh, additionally, yeah, there is a request from the users to automatically open the browser similar to the code authorization cloud. Because yeah, in BM, yeah, code authorization cloud is a very useful. But uh, in the laptop user, uh, user using the laptop, yeah, they want to open the browser automatically. So yeah, we I'm considering adding the, that feature uh, in the future. Yeah, let me summarize. Yeah, we have introduced the OIDC OOS uh, device also as you grant, and uh, that is very easy to use from the headless environment such as a VM. And uh, to use this flow, we create uh, several patches for the Keystone OS, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for your review. So, and then uh, yeah, we plan to contribute upstream OS device authorization grant in the Keystone OS in the future. That's all for me. Thank you very much.